Okay, welcome everyone to this session of the 2023 Museum Lecture Series, First People Storytelling with Uncle Larry Walsh. On behalf of Museums Victoria, I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nations where we work and First Peoples language groups and communities across Victoria and Australia. Welcome everyone who is here live at Melbourne Museum and those who are watching over our live stream. My name is Daidai Bahaklo. I am a Tanwarung, Yorta Yorta, Wemba Wemba, Tongan and Indian woman and a Programs Officer for First Peoples Experience here at Museums Victoria Research Institute. On behalf of my ancestors and people, I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Binurong peoples whose lands we all work on today and are gathered here today and pay my respects and gratitude to their ancestors as well as their elders, both past and present. The Tanwarung have been strong allies and neighbours with members of the Eastern Kulin since time immemorial with our country, lands and waterways created by Bunjil and protected by Wa. We have an unbroken spiritual, cultural, and political connection to this place we now call Melbourne for more than 2,000 generations. Our sovereignty has never been ceded. The museum lecture series seeks to connect the public with important and wide-ranging research work of museum staff and collaborating researchers. The lectures highlight Museum Victoria's collections which in turn inspire and facilitate inquiry into some of our region's key contemporary and historical questions and highlights our collaborative partnerships. If you have any questions throughout uh, tonight's session, um, for any of our speakers, there will be roving microphones. And for those who are watching online, you're able to just submit the questions. Storytelling sustains First Peoples communities, passes down knowledge, nurtures intergenerational relationships, and serves as a practice of important cultural continuation for First Peoples across this continent. Tonight, we are privileged to have Uncle Larry Walsh share some of his stories about caring for country. Uncle Larry is a Tanrung elder, cultural leader, storyteller, and an inaugural elder in residence for Museums Victoria. Please join me in welcoming Uncle Larry Walsh. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, today I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is I'm going to tell some Aboriginal stories, but I'm going to um, explain the grain of truth in them and then I'm going to give you European history and the grain of truth in that. Um, the one that we've had a little bit of lately is um, we've had a few earthquakes and um, everybody thought Victoria was safe. But I'll tell you a story that goes something like once there was this giant woman named Thuddergun. Now, Thuddergun was an evil woman and she wore a necklace full of live snakes and uh, lizards. But Thuddergun was getting old, so she was getting lonely. Now, back in the Coolin camps, there was this young boy that used to wander through the camps and everybody uh, would give him the best food and everything because whenever he smiled, it made everyone happy. Now, Thuddergun spied this um, boy, and because she was lonely, she decided to grab this boy and take him back to her country and uh, raise her uh, to stop her loneliness. Now, all the cool had seen this, so they all raced after her to get the kid back. But when she got back to her country, they were still all coming after her, so she hopped in this cave and put a great big rock in front of it that no one could move. They had tried moving it, but no one could. So they were pleading with the Thuddergun to let the uh, boy go free. Now Bunjil heard this, so Bunjil came down to see what was going on. So after he heard what was going on, 
He gathered every bird and every animal. He sent his nephews out to gather every coolant and bring them to this spot. And the coolant tried moving the rock, they couldn't. All the animals tried and they couldn't. All the birds tried and they couldn't. But Bunjil noticed, all sitting by himself, was this echidna. And um, he turned to the echidna and said, Echidna, I want you to move that rock. So the echidna hopped under and tried lifting it. He tried very hard, but he couldn't. Then Bunjil said, No, I want you to use the power I gave you. And with that, he let go with a mighty thunderbolt that broke the rock into various pieces in the cave and also broke Sadagun into various pieces. And it said, if you ever go up near Cathedral Rock, which is near Harrietville, don't camp there because uh, Sadagun is searching for bits of her body to put herself back together again. Now, why a lot of people say, oh yeah, it's a made-up story. But I've listened to uh, people who do volcanoes, people who do um, earthquakes, and there's one similarity with every story. The sound of a thunderbolt. Because when you get a very big earthquake, you do get a loud explosion at the same time. And that's uh, a fact that's hidden in the story by going, the, um, the uh, echidna has the ability. And uh, another area is he has the ability of lightning as well. Um, but what I'm giving is a fact that everybody thought no uh, earthquakes happened. But they did. And um, now, over the last eight weeks, we're working out, well, science is working out, there's actually now maybe six fault lines that they didn't know about uh, because they're too deep under the surface. Um, and so the truth of the matter is not just about the punishment and not just about protecting all children, as the story Bunjil after it was done by that all the coolant should look after all children from then on. But... Um, that was just the social part of it. The real clue in the story is about earthquakes that existed in Victoria. And um, nobody, because thanks to myths and legends, has taken it seriously. Except for archaeologists off the Western Australian coast, when the Aboriginal said, no, our land used to be further out to sea, it took about 50 years to convince the white fella to actually look. And lo and behold, they did find that what those local Western Australian Aboriginal were saying was the truth. That there was a big explosion and the ground sank. So we know that and now archaeologists are proving it. The one that always gets me is that because we're so used to Hans Christian Andersen, and who are the two brothers? Grimm. The Grimm brothers, recording all these stories. Each one of those stories is called a fairy tale or a fiction. But I'm going to tell you something. Up until 16th century, the greatest fear in Europe was the wolf. Thusly, you had Peter and the Wolf stories, you had Red Riding Hood stories, because it's only after the 16th century that they start clearing the forests for shipping. So the wolves were further, forced further back. And um, then there were the Napoleonic Wars, there was a few other, again, forcing the wolf further up into the mountains. Um, and it's like the story of Romulus and Remus, the founder of Rome. Here's the thing. The Roman army 
had a special force. And their uh, totem or banner was a wolf. And um, one of the things you'll notice about um, Nazi Germany is that some of their most feared soldiers were called the Waffen. Translation, the wolves. So the wolf has always been a symbol of fear in Europe. It hasn't been a symbol of fear for, I don't know, since the First World War. But it was always the one thing that they warned children about going into the woods. This is why uh, Red Riding Hood, the whole 12 versions, and uh, Peter and the Wolf story, uh, the whole 20 versions of them. Oh, they record them all, but they selectively edited to what stories they will tell. Because as far as they were concerned, because they were city folks, it was a fantasy. So they turned the stories into fantasies rather than their original meaning was to protect the children from wandering off into those forests and getting attacked by wolves. So all stories have a basis of a truth. It's just sorting out where the truth is within the story. Um, it's like when I first started storytelling koala stories. Um, I won't give you the first because I think the second one is much more interesting. Now, many years after, um, Kubra and the Kulin made an agreement. The Kulin forgot that they were never to hunt, skin or spear the koala. So a fight ensued. And within that fight, the Kubras remembered about the time they stole water. So they gathered all these Tarnucks. By the way, I know it's a plastic bottle, but Tarnucks were made out of wood and the bottom half, some of them were that shape. And um, so they went down to every waterway and drained all the water. They gathered it back up in the trees. Now the next morning, uh, as the sun started to rise high in the sky, the plants started to dry out. The trees started to dry out. And so the Kubras and the Kulin started fighting over water resources. Anyway, to cut a long story short, another agreement was reached uh, whereby we don't spear, skin or treat the koala the way we will a uh, common animal. However, if we get lost in the bush, we're supposed to call out, Kubra, we're lost, which way home? And um, after he grunts it a little bit and turns his head, that's the way home. Now, the interesting thing, watch the koalas during the summer months. If you watch them carefully, or even before, if you watch them carefully, you notice that they start not climbing some trees and going and eating the leaves. Why? Because the tree itself is conserving energy. So it's only sending enough energy up for th photosynthesis to happen with the leaves. But the leaves lack liquid. If you went out in the bush at that period and grabbed them and crushed them, you would notice they crush up rather than they are pliable. So it's in the story, but because every story is considered myth and legend rather than people look for the truth, um, there are many stories of destruction around Victoria Southeast. The mountain chain, its formation, some of the rivers were moved from one place to another. Um, there was areas such as Lake Mungo, Willandra Lake System, which used to be a full lake. 
which now is a desert area, but its connection to a lot of groups, because as it dried up, the groups spread out. And um, the funny thing is, some of the oldest stories always talk about coming from the north. Now, I believe that's when, when the Willandra Lake system dried up, Aboriginal people spread out throughout Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. Um, unfortunately, I'd have to go back 60,000 years to prove it, but I'm OK with that. Who knows, I may be the first old bloke to, uh, when they finally work out time travel, I'll let them experiment on me. <laughs> um, but the whole point is, and this is where Earth science really needs to sit with Aboriginal people, hear their stories and stop thinking about them the way Europeans, early Europeans did. They thought, yeah, myths and legends, uh, they can't be true. They're too primitive to know those things. Here's the thing. Every country you go to, when they talk about, I hate the word, but I've got to use it, primitive people, in other words, primitive means no written language. We didn't have written language, but we had the symbol for the stories. So that with mnemonics, that symbol would remind you of the story. And the story did have meaning. I seen the display that you did about uh, 20, 30,000 years ago, uh, outside upstairs. And uh, they did this upright kangaroo that walked on uh, their legs. And uh, I turned around and said, oh, I know where there's cave paintings of that. He said, but they died out 20, 30,000 years ago. I said, well, there's cave paintings of that. So we recorded all catastrophes and they all ended up being, that's what you get when you don't follow the rules. There's a punishment in them or there's a moral in them. But the important thing is to remember that this once happened and will happen again. And um, Earth science has not with, worked with anthropologists to actually learn the stories and hear it from the people so that you find the clue and they can take you to the exact spot where it happened. So if you did the proper examination, you may find proof of what they are saying. Um, I know um, Cathedral Rock, as I said, near, well, here you go, you're heading towards Harrietville and then you turn off towards um, Margaret Falls and then you run into um, an aptly named place, Cathedral Rock. Well, that's where the story of Thuddigan, um and that's a story of an earthquake. Um, Melbourne tells a story similar and again about Port Phillip Bay and again volcanologists and uh, earthquake people. There seems to be, a, I don't know what it is, but some are just after the um, volcanoes and some are just after the earthquakes. Um, but all of them, except that the descriptions that all tribes give, and I'm not talking about just Australia, I'm talking about Africa, South America, even some of the American Indians, give stories of land moving. Five years ago, I was working um, at um, Science Works, only for a couple of days doing um, star stories. And um, I met this 
professor and his student, and they were going over to look at an old Tasmanian story. I cannot tell the story because it's not mine, it's Tasmanian. However, the gist of the story is that Sirius Dogstar used to be further over than what it is now. So were they here in Tasmania and elsewhere to see the event of the earth tilting? Because um, I don't think Sirius, the dog star has changed position, but I'm pretty sure with what science talks about uh, plates moving and uh, slowly, what is it? Uh, a centimetre a year or something. I can't remember the figure. But the whole thing is that story gives a detailed story of a dog fleeing and uh, was further north than what the uh, Dog Star series is now. These people, I haven't run into them since then. Uh, I must one day when Science Works is bringing in that professor. Um, he's American. I forget his name. Um, and he teaches up in New South. But he started working with uh, young Aboriginal people who are studying um, uh, astronomy and have been studying their own people's stories. And now he's looking to add to the stories that everyone forgot. But he looked at me weird when I said, oh, you're talking about Dog Star seriously. He said, how do you know? No one we've ever met has heard of that. He said, oh, I met an Aboriginal fellow that told me that one years ago. Most people dismissed it because it was an Aboriginal fellow telling a story. Now, the science is investigating. And I suspect it will come down to whether the earth plate where Australia is was adjusted or whether it happened at the time of the tilt. We don't know because we only recorded what we saw and what we felt. And it may even be connected to how Port Phillip Bay was created, but from the Tasmanian side. This is why it needs investigating, uh, seriously, um, because I think the biggest mistake the world makes is you specialise too much. I have this great belief that I've discovered, not by myself, but I've discovered a way to regrow a forest. And I keep talking about three ingredients and lo and behold, every time I've heard a science program to do with those three ingredients, I go, well, I was right. Moss happens to be the first oxygen-producing plant in the world. The expert about it, she uh, works out at Tasmanian University and she even says that some of the moss in Australia is some of the oldest moss in the world. What I want to know is moss, lichen and uh, fungi are the three main ingredients to the plant life. Moss, because when it does break down, it starts to form some of the health of the soil. Uh, another form of moss is peat, uh, which, um, by the way, you can find up Lansfield to um, um, oh, what's that uh, town that's famous for its hot springs? Hey, eh? yeah, Dalesford Way. Um, so we know 
that when you examine some of the old stories, you find there's some truth within them. The problem lies in that you've been told for so many generations that what we say is a myth or a legend. Um, here's the thing. Aboriginal people can actually, in some areas, take you to the exact spot where that they remember that story started. They can take you to um, one of the big ones I'm trying to push and I'm hoping that every Aboriginal group gradually agrees is to talk to anthropologists about our sources of water. Um, most people seem to think water is going to last forever. No, it's a finite resource, just like the soil is a finite resource, just like the air is a finite resource. This is why specialisation has slowed the science of development, the science of listening to each other, the science of, well, I say this sometimes, I know you can hear me, but are you really listening? Or sometimes I know, I know you're listening, but are you really hearing what I'm saying? Um, and that's the thing, we have been taught to think certain things about stories, yet I sometimes even go, which gets me into trouble now and then, um, oh, what the hell, the Bible's only a story of 12 tribes. Don't say that when there's a full bunch of Christians. I don't like that. I don't know why. Um, but when you examine it, that's what it is. It is the story of 12 tribes who formed their own confederation, their own beliefs, and it all came out to be Yahweh, who we now call God, and all these things. Whereas, if you read it, carefully, you'll notice that the connection is to do with land they claim, not land around the world. You know, when they wanted to hand the Jewish back land, they got all the old rabbis together and the old rabbis walked the uh, perimeter of what they said in the old measurements is Israel. This was in 1948 and it was handed back to them. It's funny, we claim connections that go for thousands and thousands of generations and yet with this Christian, well, Jewish mob, the Christian world decided, yeah, they deserve the home and uh, we're going to listen to their myths and legends and agree with it. If I could take you on a walk through my area and um, point out some of the things, like Dai, you know some of the areas and some of the thing, things that exist in our areas. Some of it, like anything, I'm not supposed to know um, because there was men's business and women's business. Um, as a storyteller, I keep hold of some stories until I have to pass them back until, to whom they belong. I don't necessarily tell them, but, um, you know, uh, I don't necessarily tell those stories out loud. I just pass them along. Um, and then once they're done, I've returned it so I don't have to worry about keeping this story anymore. Um, there are two I still feel I have unfinished business with because they were told to me many years ago and um, when I retire I'm going to go visit them countries um, just for that reason to go hear if they still remember the story and then talk to their old men and old women and go, oh, actually someone told me this story X amount of years ago and um, once I say it, my responsibility is over. But every now and then, 
what can happen is some people who remember when I was with some of their uncles and aunties to hear his story, they go, do you remember if uncle or auntie told this story? Um, I go, oh, yeah, but, you know, um, I don't remember at all, but is that to do with um, why you find the... Um, snapping turtle as an important symbol. Um, as I say, it's not my story to tell, but the Yorta always refer to um, the, the uh, long neck turtle as part of their story, uh, same as they refer to the uh, giant snake, rainbow snake, as part of their story, the creation of the Murray River and all that. They're not my stories. The stories are out there. Matter of fact, I think it was in the 80s, an old fellow that worked at the museum, uh, I don't mind, I don't like mentioning the name I did, but I will in this case, which was old Uncle Sandy Atkinson. And he told the story about the Murray River used to be further over. So these people that had things to do with water asked him could uh, he show them the spot where he reckoned the story happened. And he did. And they tested the ground. And lo and behold, it was an old riverbed. It had been raised a bit, again earthquakes, but it was an old riverbed. And what happened is at the top of that old riverbed, it diverted because of an earthquake, I think, or a giant snake, whichever version you prefer, and it changed the course of the Murray, what we know as Murray River. And there's other areas where there are still people who maintain they have the story of... Um, the carnivorous emu. And um, one day one of the paleontologists here was looking through that area and he reckoned four spots where it's possible they could, the remains could be. And he grabbed the cultural worker who told him about it and he said, uh, I've got this lap here, map here of your lands. Where do you reckon the story happened? And he pointed to two spots in particular and the paleontologist said, actually, that's where I thought the bones might be. Um, so we have old memories. We know where those things happened. The story has changed a bit over the years because of the way we have to explain it. And we still have to defeat the myth and legend of... Euro thinking. Euro forgot. I mean, Thor, thunder and lightning, striking his axe and the ground shakes. Hello, that's an earthquake. Um, and never mind getting into Romulus and Remus. I did. The first Roman master army was the wolf pack symbol of the wolf. Some of the bravest fighters pre 14, 1500s in those old oh no, let's go back a thousand, two thousand years. In that period the wolf soldier was the most feared soldier because the symbol they used was the most feared in Europe. Oh, unless you were from um, um Russia and a few of those other countries because there it was the bear. Hey, come on. That's a big bugger to argue with a bear, uh, especially those big brown and big blacks. So their, import, their stories was about strength. Their stories was about resilience. But the stories say those things create the landscape. What they're talking about is like us, uh, an older version of uh, older stories 
some involve Banjo, uh, some involve other uh, Banjo Biami uh, in some areas. Um, they used either their, well in Banjo's case, his family, whereas in Biami's case, his snake and um, a few other uh, people and pets that he may have had formed their landscape. Um, but always somewhere around it is earthquakes. Always somewhere around it is uh, the Mara stories of the volcanoes. Um, we know they're dead volcanoes, but within a thousand years they won't be. Why? Because as our plate, the one underneath us, moves gradually, by the way, it moved from, according to all those scientists, it moved from the South Pole forward. It at one stage was part of Gondwana land, broke away like the South Pole, moved down, and then as the South Pole steadied, the what we call the Australasian continent moved. And um, we still have some of the oldest rock in the world, South Australia, Flinders Range. Um, it's actually so old that it's inverted. Not that I'm a rock specialist, not that I'm a soil specialist, not that I'm a, a, a plant specialist, but it's like anything. When you start to examine the stories carefully, you stop looking at the moral, you stop looking at um, the, um, the players, if you like, in the story, but you start to look at the fact. And um, I learned to judge droughts from the old koala stories. Um, but it took time because to examine those things <coughs> with only a second form education means sometimes I have to learn words that I still get confused about. I say them one way and then some scientists go, oh, you mean the, yeah, that one. Um, Latin is not my strong point. But what I'm getting at is all stories, even today's stories, always have a grain of truth. I do not make up the stories. I may tell them slightly different because I'm appealing to today's audience. But what I'm really trying to do is get everyone to learn a history that is much larger and longer than any European history. You know, they say we came out of Africa and then they changed it to say, oh, we came out, oh, the Aboriginal came out of Africa 80,000 years before the rest of the world came out of Africa. I wonder if that's true, if we have the oldest continent in the world. As far as I'm concerned, you know, um, the basis of Eden might have been here. Who knows? When you have rocks that are so old that they can't judge them, when you have science finally founding out the root of all plant life, and yet, because they only specialise in that one area, they do not see the connection between a story and the one area and another story that could complement that. Because every story wasn't just one. Every story may have a uh, complementary story, if you like. Um, I sometimes joke I would have done the third uh, koala story if it weren't for those bloody dams 
20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, like we didn't have dams of concrete monstrosities. Uh, we went with the water flow. We had other ways of tracking water and being able to keep alive. And by the way, you know the interesting thing about koala stories? Koala stories are the only one I know that seems to have man's intervention in the creation of the koala. Because the original story I tell is about a little boy who got changed into a koala. So every other was created by, for want of a better word, the creators and their families or the gods or their families. Not so the koala. It's actually human intervention that created the koala. And it's possibly why the koala, um, for when you use it for uh, tourism, it's the drop bear. No, it's true. The koala fighting with the humans is uh, 30,000 years old, maybe more. But you Europeans picked up on it and all of a sudden it become the drop bear. And now it's the Bundyan drop bear, uh, the last ads I've seen about drop bears. Um, but you stole it from us without acknowledging us. Whenever I hear people going on the bay to fish and they go, oh, old wives' tale, you know, um, when the... Um, when the Coastal bottle brush flowers drop, the snapper will be in. Is it a snapper? Yeah. It's an old wife's tale, okay? Here's the thing. You didn't have bloody snapper. Oh, wait. No, it's one fish that's particular to the, I think it's snapper. And you didn't have tea tree. So, again, you've co-opted it in one of our stories a way of us understanding when it was the right time to fish for certain things because the plants told us the fish were coming. Years have co-opted into an old wives' tale without acknowledging that you stole it from Aboriginal and didn't have the uh, decency to acknowledge that. You just had the temerity to make it an old wives' tale. I had an argument with the fishing club about that once. Did not end well. But that's the whole problem. You've taken some of our stories and turned them into new stories and uh, created your own myths and legends about them whilst ignoring the original source. It's like my argument about the man from Snowy River. Um, there's a few people over here, some historians, uh, you know, with the academic degrees and that, reckon that Banjo Patterson used to go up to the Snowy River when he was a young kid for holidays with his family. And um, euphemism, euphemism, whatever it is, that word, when you're describing an Aboriginal without describing them, oh, you know, look like a young lad. You didn't want to say black, so you use euphemisms, which is why we're pretty sure a lot of Aboriginal people, that when they talk about the man from Snowy River, they're actually talking about an Aboriginal. And um, last year, one of the discussions I've been having for a while and other uh, historians have been having for a while is the only painting of the driver's wife, her back's turned. Why is that? If it was a white woman, they'd show her back in the 1800s. But the only painting is with her back turned. That famous poem could actually be about an Aboriginal woman. And 
still to this day, there's still Aboriginal families thriving, as their families have done since the coming of the Europeans. So for me, stories are a way of viewing the world differently. Take the message in them and examine them. I'd say with the two I know, that means I'm talking about a 20 to 25,000 years between stories. Because, well, as we suffered climate change, and we did, because we used to have great forests and then all of a sudden they thinned out and all those big animals died out. And um, the funny thing is, most of the animals we see today were still alive in that period. Some of the plants we see today were still alive in that period. Thanks to talking to um, paleontologists and that, I've actually, oh, you mean the bloody wattles, one of the oldest trees? Because the wattles survived. Not every tree or plant survived the changing of climate. But the wattle did. Oh, yeah, and every now and then you find that rare plant that somehow hidden in the uh, big forest and the mountains, like that one, uh, the Willamite pine. Um, thought to be extinct for thousands of years and there it's still growing because nobody knew. Uh, the only place I don't want to visit is um, because for me, every time I tell a story, some other Aboriginal group comes up to me and goes, ah, you should come and visit us because no matter where you go, there is a similar story or a story with a different moral. Like, I think Victoria is the only one that talks about that man was the cause of the koala. Everybody else talks about the koala as uh, an ancestral being. And I've met some koala people. Um, they're a really old bloke. Uh, 80s, and he was proud of being a koala man. Um, and that was interesting because when you do a story, sometimes some of those people, Aboriginal people go, oh, I remember that because um, I remember my great-grandparents telling me. One day I was telling a story about a punishment and this old bloke, he come up to me and uh, in front of other people, and he said, you're right, because my grandmother did that to me. Um, also, my grandmother did it to my uncle. But what I'm getting at is that nearly every Aboriginal family, when you mention some things that happen just amongst Aboriginal communities, they know of someone it happened to, or their family was involved in some of the smoking to get the bad spirit out. Um, so it's not like it's uh, a negative story. It's more that they involved the area that when that happened and those people remembered it and uh, they had a diadetic memory. They used, and I always use this one, they used song, dance, paint and a poem. And the best example I know is Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. Think about it. All of you have learned it and yet when you have kids and they try and do it and say, oh, I learnt this thing and you join in because you bloody grew up learning it too. It's how that mnemonic memory works. Story, song, dance, painting. And uh, so you didn't need written language 
because the clues in the story, song, dance and painting allowed your, I think it's mammomic, uh, to actually function because deep down you were taught that story from a young age. Deep down you were taught that painting at a young age. Deep down you were taught that song at a young age. Deep down you were learnt that dance at a young age. And every bloody one that's ever gone to kindergarten in Australia knows uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars or Mary Had a Little Bloody Lamb. Um, sorry Mary, it's just um, I only look at lambs to eat, not as pets. Um, so what I'm getting at is that a hundred and ninety years of dismissing climate change stories, a hundred and ninety years uh, of finally realising that water is a finite resource, a hundred and ninety years and then you start to get earthquakes in Victoria again. By the way, it's not the end of them. There will be new stories told about them because as we keep moving and the undersea plates keep moving, sooner or later we're going to have more and more uh, earth crust activity. And... Um, I'll let that up to my children's generation to create the stories of that um, because we're aware what those stories refer to and I'm trying to get everyone to learn stories, hear them and then take it and go, okay, what bit of this can I prove right or wrong? I mean, it's pretty hard to prove the moral right or wrong, but within that story there is always a grain of truth. Every story I hear that comes out of you, Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm, by the way, there's a 10 that they never published Red Riding Hood stories, and there's a few other Peter and the Wolf stories, depending on which part of Europe you lived in is how the story was told. Sorry to interrupt. No Uncle. worries. <laughs> Would love to hear more of you. Um, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, can everybody please give Uncle Larry a round of applause? <laughs> and I reckon we may have some time for a couple of questions, maybe one or two from the audience. If anyone has a question. Yep. Um, hi there. Thank you so much, Uncle Larry. I've um, got there's so many interesting stories and connections there. I just wanted to say for our people online, unfortunately, we didn't have the, the question and answer uh, function turned on. So sorry you weren't able to send your questions in tonight. But that gives more scope for the people here in the room if you've got a question that you'd like to ask. Uncle Larry, um, now's your chance. Yeah, anything except do I play didgeridoo? No. <laughs> and the truth is, I just haven't got the lips for it. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to use the excuse I'm a Victorian, so I don't play it. I'm being honest. When I go, I'm supposed to go, <laughs> so I can't play the didgeridoo. Um, and some people say, oh to your dance, and I go, no, not really, I pantomime. I'm too old to dance. And I keep saying, which sometimes happens to me, that one moment I'm saying, oh, yeah, my left knee's playing up. And then I forget, and then I go, oh, my knee's playing And someone goes, well, weren't you pointing the other knee before? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I sometimes get caught. The truth is I'm a terrible dancer. Yeah. Um, 
Um, hi, Uncle Larry. It's been lovely to listen to you this evening. Um, you've been the inaugural elder in residence since February, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us anything that's um, been enlightening or surprising um, with uh, First Peoples community and non-First Peoples community that you've discovered whilst being in that role. Well, You're a comforting yeah. presence, I have to say. I love seeing the, you around the, the building. The funny thing is I've had an involvement with the museum on and off, even back down when it was at Swanson Street. Uh, I was involved with building the first display on uh, Victorian Aboriginal history back then at the old museum. Um, there are still a few old faces that I run into now and again um, that work here uh, because of their own passions within the place. And for me, I don't work in a place if everyone's bored or if everyone's looking like, oh, it's a job, man, that's all I do. Um, for me, passion for what you do creates uh, discovery. It also creates uh, awareness of other people's passions around you. Um, so there's still a few, few of you left from when I was working uh, at the old museum to this new museum. Um, I was involved with the uh, helping set up Panjalaka and, um, and uh, some of the young staff on the Aboriginal side have more knowledge of their areas than I do. I'm sort of the jack of all trades, master of none. But some of them um, have their own uh, knowledges, but they're always willing to add to their knowledge to expand um, their way of doing things. And also, sometimes it actually enthusiastically uh, brings me a bit of line because they'll look at something because of their studies and their experience and say something that you may not have thought about. Um, and this is the beauty of... Um, Whilst I hate my children, I don't really, but um, they always try and correct my English. Uh, but even them, their enthusiasm uh, from their learning experiences carries them through today. Uh, Dai here has been working here, and some of you all know her uh, for nearly all the time she's been here. And um, Di and I, um, because I've never been stupid enough to not hear when people are trying to tell you something, you know, like it might be a bit of advice on how to do things uh, in these days, in these climates. Um, like I have an extensive vocabulary thanks to uh, crossword puzzles. Not reading and writing and going to school, crossword puzzles. And then because of my curious mind, I talk with people about uh, ideas and some people I've talked to have actually um, helped sharpen some of my views amongst the young. And some of the knowledge here with some of the staff I've talked with, uh, like paleontology has helped me increase awareness of the timelines that they can judge here. Um, some of the research on plant and animal, uh, it interests me because I think we're heading in the right direction. It's just that we have to stop focusing on the fact that I'm a specialist or you're a specialist and what knowledge we need to share for the future. One of the things that worries me is that we know climate change is going to happen. We can't stop it. But I think 
with museum science and a few others, I think we can slow it. Not stop it, slow it. Give some of the plants and some of the animals and some of us humans time to adjust to what will possibly be the future, not necessarily for us, but our children, our grandchildren and uh, so many other generations. Someone used to say to me in the old world that it takes five generations to reach change. Um, I once uh, was considered a bit of a radical and the old lefties used to say to me, um, oh, it takes three generations to change people. They were all communists and socialists. And I would always argue, no, it takes five generations because each generation adds to what the change is. And the first change is getting used to the idea you've got to change. The second is throwing, which you don't. Like, I'm still stuck in my bad habits. So it's throwing your habits out. And the third is expanding the story. And then by the fourth generation, they add to the story and the fifth actually completes the story. So for me, we have been turned on to a world that's science-based, but not necessarily social-based. The problem with science is it looks at fact, not how the social interacts with that fact. Like, that I dare say to scientists, I can grow a forest, and they look at me like I'm mad, and then after I finish, they go, oh, you may be right because the three ingredients I name are the first three ingredients that created the rest of the plants and the rest of the oxygen that we breathe today. For me, the areas you study and expand brings new ideas to me. Um, who the thought 30, 40 years ago, second form English ends up uh, working in museums, working in, oh, by the way, this is very rarely mentioned about me, but I'm one of the founders of Indigenous Gardening and Landscaping, nationally, but yet it's very rarely mentioned about me. You know why? Because I tell everyone I'm not a good gardener. So they go, well, how could he have set it up. It's easy. When you've got the right people and you can draw the plan properly and they talk to you and have input into that plan, it grows. Um, indigenous gardening at one stage was a speciality of Melbourne. Oh, well, it's actually not even indigenous gardening. It was studying indigenous plants the first graduates to study indigenous plants were done at Melbourne University in the 70s, late 70s. And they were a bloody bunch of hippies. No, no, I'm not knocking them. Um, there was Darcy Duggan who built the um, Yarra Bend. Um, we over my side of town started... Uh, revegetating uh, parks and the spin-offs were we got an apprenticeship done, took eight years but we got it done and the other spin-off was that a lot of that ended up being also part of the rangering course. So we used old Aboriginal knowledge mixed with modern science to create a, uh, and you know what, I tried to get it only exclusively for Aboriginal people in the beginning, but that's not how the Department of Education and um, uh, Industry and Finance works. They go, no, no it's got to be available to anyone. 
Oh, well, at least for six years we had a head start on everyone. But that's what I mean. It was knowledge gained by non-Aboriginal people talking to people like Dr Beth Gott. She uh, is probably, at one stage, uh, the leading botanist researcher on native plants and their use. Um, but she worked with Aboriginal communities. She went into Aboriginal communities and would sit and talk with them and uh, ask them what they thought they used that plant for and that. And so gradually what you're studying now in botany is a lot different to what it was in 1986 when I decided that all these young Aboriginals were saying, we don't want to work in an office, we want to work outside. Oh, okay, I've got a park here we could experiment in, you know. And um, that's what we did. We adjusted it. Of course, every time those young people would mention Latin names to me, I'd go, what? Da -da -da. No, no, English, please. Da -da -da. No, no, Aboriginal name. Because um, it's we had to reclaim the names because everything taught in botany at that time and gardening was all about the Latin name. Um, and it's like going Longfellow or something or other and Dianella or something or other. Dianella, it's just a grass that you use to weave, to make baskets and things. But to use, it's got this bloody Latin name. Um, and that's gradually shifting. And again, it's because of inroads that have been made over the last 30 years in Australian botany. There's also inroads made on the study of animals, insects. Do you know, whenever you see an Aboriginal dancing the stingy bee dance, I get so many people going to me, oh, what's this traditional dance of the stinging bees? I go, yeah, it's so traditional, it started in 1780. None of the native bees have stingers. Um, some stupid bee person thought that the idea would be to bring out the European bees and breed them with the Australian natives to produce more uh, honey. Well, they almost destroyed the native bee. But luckily, the European bee couldn't live in um, mountains and the European bee couldn't live in deserts. Uh, so we have populations of native bees still not all of them are recorded yet because that desert's bloody big uh, and it's hard to track things. Thank you so much, Uncle. Unfortunately, we've officially ran out of time. Um, can I get everybody to thank Uncle Larry, but also the techies back who are helping and our amazing museum staff? Oh, oh yeah, and by the way, um, the Children's Gallery... I also did some stories for the Children's Gallery. Um, I did them, some from me, but some from different mobs who gave me permission to tell their story um, so that it would be recorded for uh, future <coughs> young people to learn. Um, there's one that's um, from the... Um, Wallarong, there's some from the Jaja, there's I think one from um, Gunai Kurnai, I think. I can't remember, I record them all, <laughs> but we had to, uh, everyone agreed to allow me to tell the stories. Um, thank goodness I didn't get to tell the Bunjil story. Well, otherwise you'd hear me in every section. 
<laughs> You'd be passing by, oh, he's, that's Larry again. <laughs> um, but um, if you have children, by all means, it's for six and under, they crawl into this thing and they look up and there's the sky and there's all these Aboriginal sky stories, including um, one... <coughs> <coughs> my auntie used to tell, um, and that's more related to the yurta, yeah. um, on the uh, watching the uh, old woman in the moon. Mm. Um, again, uh, I was quite lucky that quite a few people agreed to allow me to tell their stories. Um, so I'm not going to take credit for yurta, what's wrong and... All the other mobs that uh, uh, were kind enough to go, yeah, yeah, he's a better storyteller than us, so he can tell it, <laughs> um, which was very kind of him. Um, I'm hoping that soon, as even today's generation is uncovering more of the old stories and more of the old ways of behaving amongst the young Aboriginal, um, I am, what do you call it? I sometimes feel that tomorrow's in safe hands for our culture. Um, and when it gets to the right point, I'm pretty sure when we have enough young, bright people bringing these things and putting them together, you'll get to learn our languages. But it just takes time because... It's one, the young are still finding things that um, if you said to me 10 or 20 years ago about some of the things that the young mentioned today, I'd be going, wow, uh, they surprised me with what they know. They surprised me with that they are dedicated to finding not only Victoria's story, but their own story is part of the Victorian story. So it's also part of a personal journey for them. And um, I've been on this journey now for 40, 50 years. I'm not the expert. Um, some of this generation will, by the time they get to my age, oh, mate, they'll have double or triple knowledge of what I know. And I'm happy with that because for so long we were forbidden. And then finally to be able to scrape together what we could and then the next generation takes it a bit further. And now I'm looking at the third generation, they're taking it a bit further. Their knowledge, some of it, is from their own families. Some of it is from elders in their community they deal with. And some of it is they have that, uh, what do you call it? The academic side enough to be able to go, I could write a paper on that or I could really contribute to that story. And um, I see what we lost, but I also see what we've gained in the young, that they're, unfortunately, they're not as patient as me, but that's, when you get old, you get more patient. Because they used to say to me that I was impatient when I was young, and we all are. But once we start looking at things and making them clear within ourselves, we will be able to make them clear to you. I'm dealing with paleontologists, fine. That is part of our story. And they're finding the bones and or the uh, break open a rock and there's a plant that no longer exists. Um, so I see some already entering into astronomy for the last 10 years. I see quite a few with history degrees, uh, quite a few with education degrees, quite a few. By the way, 
you name the field, there is now Aboriginal in it from the old stories. WA, I see last year or early this year, did the story of how they get water. Now, if you had asked them that 20 years ago, they'd have said no, because that's part of their uh, sacred stories. So it's that the younger generation is encouraging the older ones who may have knowledge to share that knowledge and look at a new way of expressing that knowledge. Um, I, in the end, think that people that work here amongst the Aboriginal will be um, bringing more stories, bringing more truth about what some of the old uh, stories have in their memory. See, our old people were not stupid. They didn't understand English, but they knew that they were going to be forbidden. So they hid facts in the story that the white fella didn't see because they thought it was a myth and a legend rather than there is actually a truth in it. And these younger ones, they're better at finding the truth than I am. Um, and that's because they have studied how to look for the truth, study how to be patient, because it won't happen overnight, study what can be improved on in our knowledge. And one day, I hope it's not another 100 years or so, our knowledge mixed with some of yours will actually help to change people's perceptions of Australia. I mean, Europe, the way we farm is Europe because it's always got water. Because that's because it's a cold place and it's got all these mountains. We do not have that luxury, we also have to change the farming methods. We also have to change how we farm. And the only ones that can do that is all you earth science people. And uh, working with Aboriginal people to see how the land works, how the land has evolved and how we can assist with its future evolution. Not that I'll be here because I, you know, I don't want to live to be a thousand years old. Again, thank you so much, Uncle. Um, if you are all interested, we do have some other amazing museum lectures and also future forums. You're more than welcome to have a look on our website at Melbourne Museum um, for more information. Thank you. Thank you.